Hello and welcome to Middle East Matters. I'm James Vazi. Now coming up on this week's show. Bahrain joins the Emirates in normalizing ties with Israel, a move brokered by the United States ahead of November's election. After two people were killed in tribal fighting, the hunt is on to track down illegal firearms in Iraq. Our reporters have the latest from Baghdad. And calls to ban Iran from the world of sports, this after the execution of Navid Afkari, despite demands to spare the wrestler's life. Now, it's being hailed as a historic accord. The deal normalizes ties between Bahrain, the UAE and Israel, an agreement that comes just a month and a half before US voters head to the polls. But it's nonetheless been a divisive issue. Palestinian leaders are calling for protests, describing it as a stab in the back. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, however, has made very clear that negotiations with the Palestinians are off the table for now. Peter O'Brien and Solange Moujan have more. It's called the Abraham Accords, a name with all the gravitas of that patriarch of Judaism, Islam and Christianity. Announced last month, the agreement between Israel and the United Arab Emirates to establish normalized relations was brokered by the United States. Leaders in the U.S. and Israel dubbed it a historic breakthrough. They agreed to finalize a historical peace agreement. Everybody said this would be impossible. This is the greatest advancements toward peace between Israel and the Arab world in the last 26 years. Bahrain also joined the accords last Friday, becoming the fourth Arab country to do so, following Egypt, Jordan, and on August 13th, the Emirates. As well as creating embassies and greater diplomacy, normalized relations may also mean collaborating on investment, tourism, and telecommunications. Security ties will also likely be beefed up, allowing greater pushback towards Iran's strategic presence and its nuclear program. As part of the deal, Israel has agreed to suspend annexing parts of the West Bank, though Netanyahu has stressed that these projects are delayed and not cancelled. This rapprochement with Israel has split opinion internationally. Some praise it for promoting peace, and others call it electioneering for Trump and Netanyahu. For many Palestinians, it is akin to a stab in the back. They feel it marginalizes their plight, as they rely on Arab nations to help them resist Israeli occupation. Such alliances, they feel, should not be in place until Israel leaves the occupied territories and a Palestinian state is created. And Israel is going back under lockdown this Friday after a surge in cases of COVID-19. Many are angry about the stay-at-home order that is set to last at least three weeks. But it comes as Israel seems to record the second highest infection rate in the world behind Bahrain. Celebrations for Yom Kippur are set to be low-key this year. The restrictions will coincide with the holiest day in the Jewish calendar. Monty Francis has the latest. Israeli police enforced the first coronavirus lockdown in the spring with an iron fist, arresting those who went outside without authorization. A clash especially evident in ultra-Orthodox neighborhoods, where collective gatherings and studying of sacred texts in groups are a way of life. Now those tensions are set to surface again, with another lockdown to last at least three weeks starting Friday. A stay-at-home order prompted by a huge surge in the number of infections and deaths from the virus. In emergency rooms, doctors fear a massive overflow of patients in the coming weeks. If it's in the winter and you have also uh, influenza and corona together, that, that might be very tough. It's another blow to the country already suffering economically with an unemployment rate that went from 4 to 21 percent since the start of the outbreak. Schools and gyms again closed, along with restaurants, stores and any unessential services. Many Israelis are frustrated. This lockdown is entirely political. Netanyahu wants people to sit in their homes and not protest against him. The lockdown comes during religious observances, including Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. Celebrations will be curtailed, with indoor gatherings of more than 10 banned and 20 outside, no more than 500 meters from where you live. 
to Iraq now, where two people were killed and 17 were injured in northern Baghdad as a result of inter-tribal fighting over the past weeks. The clashes come as the country's prime minister is already struggling to enforce the rule of law and bring paramilitary groups, which are backed by Iran, back under control. Authorities are now on a mission to confiscate the firearms. Weapons have been flooding the black market by the millions ever since the fall of Saddam Hussein back in 2003. That was when police stations and army bases were looted at the time. Our correspondents from Baghdad have this report. Shaka and his brother Saleh are from one of two tribes that have clashed violently in recent weeks in Baghdad. They say they had no part in the fighting, but found themselves in the crossfire of the two groups. We heard that there were armed men on the roof. We came and there was a shooting. You see, there are bullet holes there. Following the clash, security forces launched an operation to restore the peace. But for Shaka and his brother, it was too late. The house was riddled with bullets. Their shopping warehouse, bought a few years earlier, was burnt to the ground. For the warehouse and its contents, we lost $5.8 million. Similar operations to those witnessed here in Baghdad have been launched in the southern city of Basra, where the government is struggling to rein in heavily armed militias, which operate with impunity. Taking guns off the street is part of a broader initiative to try and boost law and order across the country. More than 7.5 million weapons are held by civilians in Iraq, according to gun policy, partly explaining why the country is one of the most dangerous in the world. This is a reality that Mohammed Qadem, a neighbour of Shaka, knows all too well. He lost his 29-year-old son in the conflict between the tribes. Our tribe will take revenge. There were two dead and two injured in our home. If the tribes don't sit down and find a solution, there'll be a problem, a big problem. The government must prosecute the killers. He has no role here. The Humvees, the army, the popular mobilization forces, they're useless. An eye for an eye ethic is prevalent in tribal culture, but for Mohammed, this is necessary only if law enforcement is weak. As long as the state is weak, there's no solution. If the state had gun control and there weren't any owned by the people, nothing like that would happen. They just argue in the street and that's it. Recently, Iraqi Prime Minister al Qadami pledged to confiscate illicit weapons and limit the use of force to state security services. But with Iraq's black market flooded with guns, it will be a daunting task. Now, sports associations and leaders from across the world have condemned the execution of Navid Afkari in Iran. The wrestler was hanged in a prison in Shiraz after he was convicted of stabbing a security guard that was in an anti-regime protest back in August 2018. He claimed he was innocent and that he was tortured into confessing the crime. The World Players Association, which represents tens of thousands of athletes worldwide, has made a call to ban Iran from the sporting world. Olivia Salazar-Winspear has more. International outrage at the execution of Navid Afkari. Iran's recourse to the death penalty for the champion wrestler has prompted scorn from U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who called it a vicious and cruel act, in addition to condemnation from the European Commission. When it comes to the execution of uh, Mr. Afkari, I think our statement issued this morning was very clear. We, we condemned his execution in the strongest possible terms. Navid Afkari was charged with the voluntary homicide of a civil servant during an anti-government demo in 2018. The Water Department employee was stabbed to death at the protest in August. This video, broadcast on Iranian state television, shows Afkari confessing to the crime while being questioned. <laughs> Yet his conviction and sentencing have come under scrutiny from human rights groups who say his confession bears the hallmarks of coercion and even torture. The International Olympic Committee expressed its sadness that diplomatic pressure prior to Afkari's execution had not appeared to influence authorities in Shiraz with other sporting bodies calling for Iran to be suspended from international competitions as a result. We're satisfied um, based on that, based on the work of other groups, such as the Centre for Human Rights in Iran, that Navid is innocent of, of the charges. 
Um, but also sport surely needs to be opposed to the death penalty as well on any athlete, on any member of the Olympic movement, of any person who's affected by the activities of the Olympic movement. On Saturday, protesters gathered outside the Iranian embassy in London to echo these concerns. A peaceful demo with few consequences for the participants, unlike a German diplomat in Iran who was summoned by the foreign ministry in Tehran following comments on social media condemning Afkari's execution. And we end in Egypt, where the Cairo Celebration Choir has come together online to record a song with a hopeful message amid the current pandemic gloom. Inspired by similar projects across the world, the members of the choir each recorded their parts on their phones before putting everything together. We're going to leave you with these pictures. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Bye bye. Here at France 24, we're taking a broad outlook by talking about the women who are reshaping our world. In France 24, in Spanish, we don't have topics vedados. And that can be seen on TV and all the internet platforms we have. We're in France 24, and we're going to show you a week, 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 a week